Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, we are here for the Zoom for exploring the exhibit, Seeking Truth at the Brew House. We are going to get started here in just one minute. It's like a couple of people are still coming in. Okay. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight. I'm Natalie Sweet. I'm the program director here at Brewhouse Association and I'm coming to you live from our gallery in the South Side. We're really delighted to have you all join us tonight for our first ever Zoom event, which is going to include a debut of a short video documenting our exhibition, Seeking Truth. And following that, we'll be joined by some of the artists in the show for a live discussion about their work. And then finally, we're gonna announce the next cohort of artists that'll be participating in our distillery program. You may be noticing that the Zoom platform looks a little bit different than you're used to. That's because we're using a webinar version. Um, so you should be seeing me along with a pretty boring white slide of our logo in the middle. And the key thing I just want to note is that at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. And this is where you'll go if you'd like to submit a question for one of our artists during the event tonight. You can use this to submit questions at any point throughout the evening. And if your question is aimed towards a specific artist, we ask you to please specify who it's for and we'll do our best to try to get to as many questions as possible. You might also notice down there that the chat function has been disabled and that's okay. That's because we're using the Q&A function. Um, you might see a notification pop up on the chat. You probably will. We're going to be sending you some links through there, but if you want to interact with us, the best way to do it is through the Q&A. So for anybody who um, might be unfamiliar with our organization, extra thank you for choosing to spend your time with us tonight. Brewhouse Association is a nonprofit art center where we have a gallery and host rotating exhibitions. Um, our gallery is actually currently open to the public on uh, Thursdays through Saturday, as well as by appointment. And we have special safety uh, precautions in place. Masks are required when coming to the gallery. If you would like to set up a private appointment to be here on your own, we are also offering that and we'll share an email where you can set that up at the end of the event. We um, have a creative cluster here where we also provide artist studios. We work with independent artists so that they can grow their businesses and their artistic practices here in a supportive community around other artists that are doing the same thing. And we also host a range of programs that support artists and the other individuals that make up our, our healthy arts ecosystem here in Pittsburgh. So tonight, we are um, focusing on our distillery program, which is currently in its 10th year running. And um, distillery, I think, is a unique program because of a couple of reasons. The thing that I really like about distillery is that it brings together artists who come into the program, usually as strangers that are working in different dis disciplines and coming from different backgrounds to work side by side in the studios for a whole year. And through this process, um, the artists end up expanding, expanding their networks and their friendship circles. And in doing that, they're gaining new knowledges and exposure to new processes, new points of view and ways of working. And as a result, they might end up taking risks or trying new things in their artwork that they might not have otherwise. Distillery also provides some more tangible resources to artists like 250 square feet of subsidized studio space, um, access to professional development resources, a network of local mentors, and an exhibition opportunity. Distillery um, typically works with seven artists each year, and you can see the artists listed on your screen who have been a part of our current cohort, the 10th cohort. Um, and typical, I think we can all say 2020 has been anything but. Usually, 
Um, our artists all work with us at the Capstone exhibition, which we'll be talking about tonight. But, um, you know, we've all been faced with tough decisions this year. And um, Sheila Swartz, who has been a really big part of our cohort, ended up deciding not to participate um, in the exhibit this year. But we still wanted to take just a second to highlight her because she's been such an important part of our group and share a little bit about her work since you won't see her in the video coming up. Um, Sheila is a sculptor and she incorporates everyday objects like building materials and cloth to create really emotional works, um, sculptures that hold layered and poetic stories within them. And we're really uh, proud of her and all the artists that have been a part of Distillery this year. So um, Seeking Truth, the exhibition, it was originally scheduled to happen in May. Typically our distillery program runs a year long from July through June each year, but um, you know, like we're all living through 2020, we've made some minor adjustments to our timeline. Um, but I was thinking back to early March when I spent the last time I was really in the studios with all of our artists and we had a brainstorming session where we were planning for the show. And um, we were talking about themes that the artists were working on and throwing up words on a whiteboard together. And some of the words that came up on the board were things like time, clarity, hidden messages, illusions, catalyst, redefining, and constructions of reality. And I want to mention this not only to share with you a little bit about our process and how the theme came to be, but um, I feel like it's really difficult these days to separate anything we're talking about from the current events that we're living through. Um, but on this timeline, I just want to note that these artists were really thinking about the idea of truth and these um, ideas that I mentioned many months or, you know, even before that, before Americans as a whole were witnessing the devastation from COVID-19, before there were widespread pro protests about against police brutality emerging. These artists were already on that pulse. They were already looking to reveal societal blind spots in their work and to shed light on shared human experiences. They were pushing their boundaries and taking risks in seeking truth. And out of this search and creative risk taking, they ended up making works that I think really demonstrate the profound outcomes that are possible when we try something new, when we look at something in a new light or from a new perspective. Oh. So I would like to invite you all into the gallery with me to view um, by way of viewing our video. And um, we are gonna be streaming this over Zoom, but at the same time, I will also be dropping a link into the chat because sometimes we know internet uh, connections can be a bit spotty. And if you have any issues viewing, you can check back at this link to view it again in the future. So the video should be starting any second here. Um, one second, sorry. Um, oh, here we go. My name is Njami Njai, and I'm a photographer, filmmaker, and multimedia producer. 
My work in the Seeking Truth exhibition is a series of digital collages that explore life in a fictional version of an American city. I see these collages as an extension of my documentary practice because each one features a portion of a photo that I've actually taken, but they're placed in a totally new context. I supplemented old work prints with images from magazines to create surreal scenes that explore long-standing societal issues, but that also ponder better futures. By incorporating real-world imagery, I hope to communicate that as real as our social ills are, seeing a world without them needs to feel just as tangible. I'm constantly balancing these feelings of frustration with this within me, and this body of work serves to explore those feelings and everything in between. I'm Senta Schumacher and I work in photo and video. I make my work with a special lens that I built for my camera that's made of pieces of old lenses that have kind of cobbled together. In this show, I was thinking a lot about eclipses and about the sort of transitory state of them. It's this event where something obscures something else and light and or energy that people interact with in this world uh, shift and change and it brings about often uncomfortable change. And if that isn't what we have all been experiencing lately, I don't know what is. Kind of as a society, we're all in this eclipse season of, of shifting and changing whether or not it's uh, caused by um, the moon and the sun moving through the sky or not. My name is Adam Lynn, and I am a Pittsburgh-based artist working in drawing and printmaking. My work in Seeking Truth explores the world of queer desire and isolation through the lens of anthropomorphized feline characters. I seek to mock the monotony of the everyday by having these characters perform life's otherwise unseen or unimportant moments with an exhibitionist vigor. My work relies heavily on the seductive potential of drawing as a means to coax, flirt with, and poke fun at the heteronormative representations of the cartoon language. With glossy eyes and cheeky smirks, the queer feline figures I create invite the viewer to question the seriousness and importance of the minutia that occupies their day-to-day -day existence. These uncovered truths highlight the experiences and sentiments that define our humanity while blurring the distinctions between animal versus human and cartoon versus real life hierarchies. Hi, my name is Brendan J. Hawkins. I am a multidimensional being that practices within everything that is available. This piece is my survey on surveillance how it is felt as a body to be under the eye of surveillance and now having the power to, power in quotation marks, having the power to put that eye, that lens back on to uh, other bodies as everyone is looking for the liberation, which is seeking truth, um, we are finding that power always pops back up. So this for me is the power of the image. And as a black figure, um, as, a, as a figure in general, you know, I, I, I want to think about what that means in 2020. My name is Jamie Ernest. I am an artist. Previously I would say I was a painter, but I had a breakup with painting. So now I'm an artist and I create things. This specific body of work is tied to exploring the ideas of Southern hospitality, which is, you know, the stereotype of Southerners being warm and caring and having a welcome for others outside of their circle, which seems to be very altruistic, right? And I found growing up in the South that altruism and Southern hospitality didn't really click and they kind of clashed. So with these pieces, these sculptures and serving trays and food trays, evoking the idea of sharing food together, breaking bread together, big in the South and all over the world, um, exploring ways that they kind of clash. So the polarization versus the acceptance and welcoming. My name is Kamara Towns, also known as Wavy Wednesday. 
I'm a portrait artist whose medium is house paint and glitter. My artwork in the show is an interplay of fun, femininity, and Black culture. It represents the more playful aspects of my experience as a Black female artist and the responsibilities that come with it. My work in this show relates to truth because the specific type of aesthetic that the Black women in my portraits consist of would fall under a category that most people would call extra, banji, and even ghetto, even though these same women are the pioneers of our fashion and beauty industry. Our creativity and culture often get stolen and then appropriated without the credit and reparations that are deserved. So I decided that whether we embrace our natural hair and nails or decide to wear 40 inches of neon weave with long decorated fingernails, Black women need shown the most amount of appreciation and representation as possible. Okay, I'm off mute. Hello again, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, watching the video with us. And I just wanna give a note and a shout out that that video was produced um, by N. Jamie and Jai, who is not only an artist featured in our exhibition, but an amazing producer and storyteller all around. Um, and Jamie runs Eleven Stanley Productions, and I would highly, highly recommend reaching out to her uh, for your next project if you need help telling a story as well. I also want to mention that um, a lot of the work in this exhibit is for sale, so if something caught your eye, let us know. Um, we've also partnered with Small Mall, which is the concept store for Casey Drogi Cultural Productions. It's an artist-run space located in Lawrenceville, and they sell work by many of our region's most talented artists, so definitely check out their store online or in person as well to help support their arts in our region. Um, but now, as you can see, I'm excited because the artists are joining me here and we're going to have a little Q&A amongst ourselves and then we'll um, answer some of your questions as well. So I'm going to start off by asking Jamie a question. Jamie, um, you talked about your breakup with painting and there's been a lot of COVID breakups happening so people can relate. Can you tell us um, a little bit about what caused your breakup and how your new relationship is going with sculpture these days? Yeah, so I would say since about maybe mid 2019, um, I'm still looking at you Natalie, so I don't know if I'm supposed to be in the middle, but we're good. Um, so it was really hard for me to paint. For a while I was, forcing myself to paint when in reality, I think I was actually bored with it. It just became really frustrating. It's kind of like when you're a kid and your parents feed you the same oatmeal for breakfast for like four years in a row, and then you decide you really never want to eat oatmeal for breakfast again. That's the best analogy I can come up with. So there was like this voice in the back of my head for that long telling me just to try something different. And that painting and I just needed a break. <clears throat> so, I've always been a, a sucker for texture and touch and something about my paintings felt arbitrary, like the objects and the stories that I was painting were more important than the background of the painting, like the airy space that those depictions existed in. So I wanted to bring those objects out into the world, but there was a lot of fear involved in that because I had been painting for so long. I was so confident in what I was doing and where my paintings were growing and evolving that it took me about five months to completely abandon painting and just begin exploring. So in January of 2020, I did a month-long residency at Vermont Studio Center. And when I got there this past January, I was like, all right, I'm not gonna paint. And I just decided to experiment with tons of materials. And I spent the whole residency honestly learning how to fail and how to fail successfully. 
in a way. So it was not just a huge learning curve for me, um, but it was also a big learning curve for my work too. It was a weird place to be in. Um, I wasn't even really 100% sure why I didn't want to paint, why I wanted to bring these objects out, but it's just that voice in the back of your head that's like, all right, you need to you need to do this. You need to try something else. So as I mentioned in the video, the pieces in the show are very sculptural, and I wanted to explore my relationship with Southern hospitality. Having grown up in the South, my mom, who's also on this call, hi mom, uh, <laughs> raised me with the virtue of Southern hospitality, but she definitely implied more of an altruistic way of practicing it, right? So selfless concern for the well-being of others, welcoming for everybody, that type of thing. But as I got older, I realized that that type of Southern hospitality wasn't exactly being practiced around me. And there were a lot of gaps between the things that I thought were right and things that other people were doing around me. So by utilizing these sculptures as uh, food trays and having them be these weird things that sit on the wall, I, I wanted to embrace the act of uh, communal gathering of food, like potlucks and shared meals. And there's something, you know, these objects are like, they're juicy, right? You kind of want to eat them, you kind of want to touch them. They're alluring, but as you get closer, and I hope all of you go see the show to see them all closer, there's definitely some eerie things that exist in each one of them. Like the, this is, those eerie things are the uneasy, the learned fear, and the judgment that influences the true nature of our altruistic hospitality in the South. And I had, and I'm still having such a growing experience by taking a break from painting that I think my little detour here right now will actually ultimately make my relationship with painting stronger in the future. And we might get back together. Um, but right now I'm kind of enjoying this, this experiment time and uh, learning a whole bunch of new things. And maybe, maybe we'll get back together. But in contrast in the show, Camara, Wavy Wednesday, your paintings are incredibly strong and it makes me feel like you and painting have a very steady relationship. So I'm just wondering how, how is your relationship with painting? Well, thanks, Jamie. My relationship with painting is still going strong. Um, it, my relationship with painting started when, when I went to college in um, the fall of 2013. I initially, I've always been artistic, but I went into college um, with the plans on experience in curation. So I kind of went with like the art history route when I got to school and I learned quickly that I that the art history route wasn't for me because that was my major when I first started. And then I didn't know what else I was into or what else I liked. So I just switched my major to fine arts. Um, and once I did that, I that's kind of how I fell in love with painting. I went um, every, I was in school for five years and every year that went by my art had just progressed and I got more recognition for what I was doing. But at the same time, I was very nervous as graduation got closer and closer because I had just did I wanted like a solid plan and for some reason like the natural negative stereotypes on being an artist like not being a real job or a real career bothered me and followed me throughout my whole college career um but also I was getting better and I was getting like art collectors and stuff like in school so it, it took me like my last semester to really be okay with the fact that being an artist is a real career in a real job and a real profession and something to be taken seriously so that's our relationship right now um as far as the work in the show i have a question for adam I noticed that 
you have like monochromatic pieces and then you have pieces that are black and white. So I basically just wanted to ask what is the significance of your color palette and the, the reasons why certain colors are on certain pieces? Adam, wherever Adam is. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hi, Adam. Hi. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so in the work in the show, there's kind of like three different color stories happening. There's like the monochromatic ones, um, like the colored, the blue one, the black and white, and then like the full color. And they kind of all um, sort of like originate from a different place. Um, the blue sort of like this journey went on, which was to the point where I could actually like the color blue because like you know as a kid growing up it was kind of like the color that was assigned to you know boys of a young age it was like the color assigned to like masculinity and I kind of like resented it for so long because of that and I never wanted like anything to do with it so I found that as I was getting older and like becoming an artist I wasn't using any blue in my work and it was starting to look really like bad <laughs> um like color wise so I developed a relationship where I was using it purely um you know isolated and by itself but I was kind of like coming up with these new terms that I could enjoy this color and kind of form a new experience with it um and then the full colored pieces the ones that are on like the panels um, those have like a lot of magenta in them, which the magenta sort of comes from like two different things. Um, one of them is like as a printmaker, um, that's like a really popular color that's used in like a lot of techniques and that's my background. Um, and so it's kind of like a weird color because it's like sort of artificial looking, but um, it's used in a lot of like photographic reproductive methods and printmaking and like ways to make um, something look like really realistic, like um, the original photograph or image of whatever means that is. Um, and so I kind of like the idea of using this magenta color, which is like clearly like a very hot sort of like pinkish purple um, and having that as like the color of the, the figures because they're all sort of, um, I see them as like these male like cat figures but they take on all these different personalities and they take on they like wear all these different outfits and put on wigs and I kind of was thinking about like the color pink sort of as like a signifier of queerness and something that you like wear on your body it doesn't sort of like you can't like wash it off and so I was thinking of it as like manifesting on like the surface um as a way to sort of like identify this character um and give it no choice but to exist the way it is and it has to like accept these facts and it has to sort of like find other ways to navigate its identity because that part of it is like on the surface um so that's kind of where the like magenta sort of like idea of creating these like pink cat boy characters comes from um and then the like monochrome like graphite pieces were all made like at the height of COVID. So they were really um, like when I was in my apartment with nothing else to do, like no job, nothing. Um, and they there felt like a void, like there felt like there was a lot missing in my life, obviously, because there was like nothing going on, everything was locked down. So I was kind of like paring things down and going to just black and white and seeing like what I could achieve with just like the bare minimum, just like graphite and paper. Um, and everything sort of like shifted scale and got a lot smaller and tighter, but I sort of developed a relationship with graphite that probably I wouldn't have otherwise just because I was able to stare at it and use it without any like self judgment for like a long time inside. Um, and that was pretty cathartic. Um, so speaking of black and white, um, I actually have a question for Senta. Um, something I really admire in your work is like the use of black kind of like as a void space, but then you have these like pops of color and flecks of color. Um, and I love how that's all coming from your like camera lens, you know, configuration. So I was wondering like what the significance is of how you configure your lenses and sort of how that translates into what materials you end up printing those on. Yeah, thanks Adam. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so 
To explain a little bit more about the lens that I use, I have this special lens that I created for my camera that's made out of parts of vintage lenses that I've taken apart and put back together basically wrong. And so it does strange things to light. It, uh, it distorts it, it pulls things apart, um, it, it, it abstracts things. And often what I'm photographing is are objects that are incredibly mundane, broken pieces of plastic or glass uh, the light reflecting off of like mushy, dirty, melting snow. And, um, and the lens transforms the light that's reflecting off of it into this beautiful kind of transcendent experience. Uh, and because of that, because I, I like to think of it as like, photography was invented to capture reality, right? It, um, you know, was first invented as this way to make portraits of people. Uh, but my camera, my lens, uh, creates something new. It like creates a different world. And, um, and so because of that, I, uh, I also spent a January at Vermont Studio Center a couple years ago. And uh, I came to the conclusion there after a lot of experimentation that my work, because it was so otherworldly and so not real, didn't feel like it fit with um, traditional photographic printing methods. And so I started experimenting with different medium to put my work on. And I really um, enjoy working with fabric, like the pieces in this show, because what it does is it has this, um, this is amazing presence to it. It's a very light fabric and it's almost see-through, it's like semi-transparent. And when you're physically in the space, looking at the work and you walk past it, it moves just from the slight disturbance in the air that your own body makes, it moves towards you and away from you. And, um, there's something about that. It really gives it life and it makes it, um, it makes it a, more of a photographic object than just a photograph. And uh, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in giving it presence because I, I want, it, it feels like what I'm trying to do with this work, with this lens is like peer into something else, into another world. And while it's funny because this show is called Seeking Truth and it's about you know, my, my work is kind of a lie in a way, but it's not really a lie. It's more like uh, potential or something that could be or um, something we haven't thought of yet. And so, um, and so, yeah, so I wanted to show up in the world in a way that doesn't feel like a photograph, that it feels surprising in that way too. Um, so with that, I'm going to go to Angie and ask her question about photography. Hey, Sensa. Hey. So we're both photographers, um, but we work very differently. And um, when we first started together here in the brew house, you were doing a lot of documentary work. And now you, I know you're still doing that, but you're also sort of transitioning into this collage work that incorporates a lot more of fantastical elements into it as well. And I was wondering what about photography you find compelling and about like, and about that transition between the kind of pure documentary and then to this more constructed element. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think kind of, as you mentioned, when I came into photography, it was very much so about documenting what I'm seeing, where I'm at. Um, and that felt important because, you know, as a black girl from Pittsburgh with a black family and in community with black people, um, I just wasn't necessarily seeing a lot of our stories represented with the diversity or the nuance that I saw that I was like living out in my day-to-day -day life. Um, those stories weren't really being represented in mainstream storytelling. So um, when I picked up a camera, it was very much about just showing like everyday slice of life, um, black stories. Um, I grew up seeing my parents take pictures. Um, they're both photographers. So, you know, my dad's specialty is like candids, catching these very subtle moments of like, people's true nature, I guess. Um, and my mom is uh, more so about portraits, um, taking pictures of like groups and families and organizations. So I think I saw both of their approaches, um, but they converged in that they were all about preserving a moment, capturing and preserving a moment. Also, I grew up um, looking at Teeny Harris um, coffee table books. So just seeing, a, his composition, I mean, his photos are gorgeous to look at because they are organized so well and because of the lighting. Um, and 
I think that provides a good access point to like seeing the people. And I was just fascinated with what he was documenting and just seeing um, the way that him and folks like Gordon Parks were being so intentional about, you know, documenting black life on purpose. And so, you know, when I started taking pictures more intentionally myself, it started with that documentary element. And then when I started working in the public sphere um, with the public art project I did in the Hill District, I started um, incorporating both archives and interviews more specifically um, and kind of letting those dictate the images that I was making. And that's when I started incorporating collage elements. So like bringing different elements of pictures that aren't really con like connected into the same frame to see what sorts of like themes I could explore and juxtapose together. Um, and with this most recent body of work, the collages, uh, like everybody else, I was sitting at home watching things just absolutely kind of deteriorate around us. Um, and I felt very helpless and felt like I just wanted to do something, make something, but I couldn't go out and take pictures as I normally would. So um, I've been wanting to go into collage for a while. So I picked up some old work prints, um, some old magazines, and my hard and fast rule was that each collage I made needed to incorporate a part of a photo that I had already taken. And so I think in that way, this new work is an extension of my documentary practice, but I was much more interested in like creating and building out environments. And so there's a lot of social commentary going on in the work. I'm thinking about greed and corruption and capitalism and racism, but I'm also thinking about like agency and hope and freedom. And I think I'm able to explore those um, ideas with that surreal lens and kind of manipulating photography in a different way than I normally would have been in my typical documentary practice. Um, and so, yeah, so these days, I don't think I'll completely like abandon documentary, um, but I am interested in using more collage and again, continue, continuing to like bend the medium uh, to see how I can explore new ideas. In particular, I'm very interested in this like continuum of time, how to bring the past into these contemporary environments we find ourselves in, and also thinking about imagining new futures based on where we are today. And that's my spiel. Thanks, and Jamie, and thank you all for sharing a little bit more about your work. I feel like um, I've had the amazing opportunity and pleasure to work alongside you all all year, but there's even some gems coming out that I haven't heard before. So um, we've got some questions coming in from the audience and um, I'll start off by asking some of them to you guys. Um, and Jamie, Teresa asked, uh, you talked a little bit about moving into collage, but um, if you could talk a little bit more about the process here, she's wondering if your collages are cut and then assembled in paper, or are you doing it digitally? How do you assemble those? And you know, how are they in the gallery a little bit more? Yeah, thanks, Teresa, and hi, Teresa. <laughs> um, so these images are cut by hand and uh, assembled in Photoshop. So I wanted to have uh, like that, te that tactile element that I don't necessarily get through digital photography that I, you do get like through film and working in the dark room, but yeah, it's a merger of both worlds. Thanks for the question. Uh, so Jamie, we also have some process questions for you too. Um, Teresa's asking, she said, hospitality versus empathy or other forms of acceptance. Fascinating conflict, just to say. Um, but she's curious about what sculptural materials you're using. She asked about ceramics and textiles, but um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more. Thanks, Teresa. Um, it's kind of funny to me that people ask me if they're ceramics. And I, don't, I, I guess it's funny because it's like, ooh, I fooled people. Um, but in a way, no, I, I've been doing a lot of casting with hydrocal and resin and a little bit of clay. So it's kind of, you know, the materials list for each of those pieces is a good like sentence long. 
Um, so the base of all of the imagery, all of the like dishes and platters, those are repurposed. So they're actual dishes and platters. They may or may not be real silver. I don't know. They're definitely not worth what they were worth before because I destroyed them. But those were the objects that remained the same. Other than that, I ended up casting a lot of objects, utilizing fabric and flocking. And I guess this is kind of painting. So I don't know if I'm like, like cheating on myself or something, but I was using molding paste through frosting bags to squeeze out this like paste that I had tinted with paint to make like those greens and other like goopy, flowy, food-like smushy stuff. Um, but it was in a very like sculptural execution. So I guess to answer your question, there they are um, a lot of things together. But my one of my favorite things about them, and it's pretty mundane, is that they're held on the wall by magnets. Like who knew? <laughs> anyway. It is a pretty genius hanging system. I don't think people, I'll always think about those things. I was very impressed when you came to install them. <laughs> I was impressed with myself before <laughs> figuring it out like three days before install. Great, super easy. For other people, you know, thinking about hanging their sculptures, good note. Um, so Jamie, we have another question for you too, uh, similar to the question we asked Adam, but can you talk a little bit about the color in your sculpture relative to your paintings? Yeah, I think that, so the way I would use color in my paintings was kind of a combination of what I like to call local color and then chosen color. So whether I choose to keep something the color that it actually is in real life, i.e. local color, or chosen color, deciding to change it. Um, and I think that, like for the example, that piece that I have with, with collard greens, choosing to keep those colors were important. But I, I will say that 30% a, a of my color choice is aesthetic, whereas the other is a little bit more local and like trying to figure out what fits together in the right ratio. I will say that I think my color um, expertise in painting is, a, is definitely stronger, but that's to be expected because I painted for so long. Um, it is something I would like to explore more in challenging how I use color in these sculptures, but I hope that answers your question, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Um, so we've got a question here for Adam coming from Paul Paying. Adam, um, Paul is asking, what does departing from a rectangular picture plane do for your work? Um, he says for him, it de-emphasizes the picture as a portal slash window slash representation of a world and emphasizes the picture as a drawn thing. Is that similar or is it different? I know that was, you know, something you came in really exploring as part of this residency and I feel like was a big success in you achieving how to do that, but maybe you can tell us some more. Yeah, I think I was coming in, um, thank you for the question, Paul, by the way. Um, I was like coming into the residency, planning on doing these big works. Like I, those were like the first things I did because that was way pre-COVID because this all started in like September or July or something, I don't remember. Um, so I was kind of already working with this idea of like, creating my own like rules for display of these drawings that felt a little bit more like luxury objects than actual just like two dimensional pieces. Like they felt like wall adornments. Um, I wanted to sort of like emphasize the surface finishes on them to be as like seductive as possible um, and to sort of like draw you in. And that's kind of like also a lot of the like angles and the like, um, the like foreshortening or like dr the dramatic perspective that I do is to sort of like emphasize this like idea that it's a three-dimensional object even though it's really just a flat piece propped off the wall but it's kind of like playing on that idea that it's a prop but it's like compelling you to try your hardest to like imagine that it's um like in a world kind of like this it's almost like an uphill battle because I know by forcing it out of a rectangle, it's going to take on more of like an object thing-like quality, but 
I like challenging myself and trying to like find a way to bring those angles and perspectives back to keep it like super dynamic and interactive. Thanks, Adam. Um, while we have you, we just got another question in from Leslie for you. And um, she's asking, she says, your drawings feel like pages out of a diary. There's a fragileness and almost a tenderness to your work. Do you feel like that's uh, going to change when the pandemic is over and you'll break back into your more brazen style? Um, there's something funny that happened with the pandemic. Well, thank, thank you for the question, Leslie. Um, I kind of like like the idea of being uncomfortable in my working space, not like totally, but in the way that I'm forced to like contort myself to like the space of my room or wherever I'm inhabiting. Um, Cause I think that produced some interesting results that I really wasn't expecting to kind of just like hone in on like the detailed work. Um, so I think from now on, if anything, I'm just gonna be a lot more responsive to the studio space I'm in and like the, environment and I'm gonna let that filter through me and sort of like channel and like that's gonna produce sort of like the different types of work that I'll end up making. Exciting. Um, so we've got some questions coming in about the future but I'm thinking we'll get to those at the end. Um, Jamie we have another question for you in your painting practice. It, this is from Paul Ping. A major part of your work was combining different pictorial spaces into one picture. Has this notion of combining spaces showed up in your projects or in your practice in any known way yet? And how does a picture space slash combination of picture spaces translate into an object space? Um, does, that, does that make sense in the way you practice? Do you think of it like that? Um, I can definitely see what Paul is getting at. Hi, Paul. Um, Paul and I have known each other for a while, but um, it's interesting because I feel that in my paintings, you're right, I was trying to like create this conglomerate space of many different sources, but, it, and it like allowed for like openings and depth and all of these things, but it's kind of funny because I feel like with these sculptures, they became all about trying to contain all of the pictorial spaces, which I think the pictorial spaces in terms of my paintings, in terms of my sculptures are actually all of these like symbols and objects that I'm using and compiling together into one piece. So in a, in a super weird way, I feel that these sculptures are more <laughs> contained than my paintings. So that's maybe like another personal struggle I'm going through um, of trying to still break out of that containment on a 3D scale. Maybe that answers your question, Paul. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, we have a question here for Kamara. Um, Kamara, Sam is asking, did your original interest in art history inform the development of your signature aesthetic? You're on mute just to... Okay, Natalie, can you read the question to me again? Yeah, she's asking, did your original interest, you were talking about how you came into school with an interest in art history, did that um, interest inform the development of your signature aesthetic? I think, you know, she's wondering about, are there any things from art history that you take into your painting practice? Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the classes that I, that really like stuck to me leaving school was called Women in Art. And it really, um, it really inspired me to like, to stick with women, all different kinds, the, the power of them, um, how plus size women were all the queens in the beginning of time and stuff like that. So yeah, that definitely still has impacted my work, even though I kind of strayed away from art history. There's yeah. stuff like, there's stuff that I reference and, and have to look up all the time for like my newer stuff now. But yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I can definitely see that connection between how the ideals of beauty have changed throughout time and mm -hmm. what you're doing in your work too. Um, so we've got a few questions that are kind of for all of the artists. Um, we're, people are wondering, you know, what's next? What's coming up for you all? Um, and also, while we go around, um, somebody said, could you pick one word that inspires you as an artist? So um, thinking about what inspires you and what's coming next. Mara, do you want to uh, try to answer those? Um, well, as far as what's coming next, I'm sure all my studio mates know, and you know, Natalie, I'm going to grad school, I actually start next week to get my MFA. So I'll be doing that on Monday, I'll be in a three year program. So wish me luck. That's the next step. As far as, um, thank you. As far as like one word, um, one word that like inspires me as an artist, I would say the word radiant. Yeah, I would say radiant. Great, thanks. Let's roll through. Jamie, what about you? What do you think is coming next? I know you said you're still, playing around with sculpture a little bit. Um, what word inspires you? Oh man, I gotta think on that word. Um, as for what's next, I think I'm still on a break from painting. I'm gonna keep trying new processes and different materials um, and maybe do a lot more writing. I think maybe painting and I'll get back together later, but I am definitely not trying to force it. So. I'm utilizing a lot of this like weird pandemic time to just reevaluate and see what path I want to take towards my relationship with my work right now. As for a word that inspires me as an artist, I think, I guess it's more of like a phrase is, you know, question your satisfaction. <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> Thought provoking to me. <laughs> um, all right, I'm just kind of rolling through you now as I see you, but Senta, um, what, what's next for you and what words inspire you in your practice? Yeah, um, it's funny. One of the last things we did as a group here or at the brew house was we had this, um, it was extremely well-timed. It was a, like a meditation and self-care workshop and um, while our amazing, amazing host was like leading us in a guided meditation and I had this like visual of myself wearing like a fabric piece that I had made. And so that's a project that I want to start next after working on this. I don't know. I know, I know how to sew it. I know how to make clothes, but I, uh, I don't know if this is going to be something anyone else ever sees, but it's something that I want to start experimenting with. Um, and uh, Let's see, the first thing that popped into my head was the void, and that, that's, always, that's always a word that I'm working with and exploring, um, and also the unknown. Thanks, Senta. Um, if you are looking for somebody to try on your clothes, hit me up, because I think those are gonna be beautiful. <laughs> um, so, Adam, what about you? What's, what's coming up next? Um, next, I have no idea. Um, I don't know, I'm moving. I'm relocating out of the brew house soon and hoping that the north side will provide me with new perspectives. I am keeping my studio in the brew house though for a month, so it's gonna be an interesting layout. Um, three of us are gonna be in there, Jamie and, and Jamie and me. It'll be fun, we'll see, who knows um, what's gonna go on in there. <laughs> And I guess with words, um, I kind of always go back and forth between like disgusting and fabulous because I really think that those can be the same thing. And with my work, oftentimes they're interchangeable. Um, I guess if anything, I just want to really uh, make those even blurrier than they already are with my work and make those even more like, I don't know. I want to like make a new word that is those two things together. So that's 
maybe that's also in the future. I'm excited to see how these new spaces you're moving into kind of affect mm -hmm. what comes out as you were saying that was so influential working from just your apartment loft compared to your studio space too. Yeah, so yeah exactly. We'll see how that changes. All right, so and Jamie, you know what I'm about to ask. <laughs> What's coming up for you? We already know you're keeping your studio here, so we're excited about that. Um, any other projects in the works? Yeah, there's there's some things uh, on the docket. Um, working on a few commissions um, that are gonna take me into really the end of 2021. So yeah just gonna kind of be consistently grinding, really thinking a lot about how to deepen my documentary practice. So thinking about, um, you know, documenting what's happening, but adding more of a conceptual element to it. Um, so yeah, just like tinkering, tinkering in my own brain, trying to figure out constantly how to elevate what I'm doing. And in terms of my word, that was my aunt Tara who asked, thanks Tara. Um, I guess archive, just thinking about what I can do and who I can talk to that in a way that will like hold space for us in the future to know that we were here. So um, we have another question for you and Jamie that's also thinking about the future, but I think a little differently than you know what's coming up exactly in your future it's a little bit more about imagining and how do you reimagine the future you talked about that a little bit when your work but yeah thank you for that question um you know that's a tricky one for me i think um as i was creating these collages initially it was just gonna be like screw everything like i was just so frustrated and so angry with what i was seeing you know, going on in society. Um, but that just felt really incomplete. And I felt like I needed to temper that by thinking through like, what would it actually look like and feel like to be free and to be like, to live a life where we're not worried so much about like navigating all of the stuff that keeps us down. So I'm still thinking about that. I think the theme that recurred the most in the collages that I made was like thinking about time. What would it mean for time to be your own? So you're not, you know, having to like work so much to like make a living. Um, you get to actually cultivate yourself as a person, figure out what your interests are, um, having everything that you need without worrying about, um, yeah, without worrying about so much oppression and just kind of spreading the wealth that we know that exists. So I don't know. I think it's a lifelong thing that I'll be thinking through, but I appreciate the question in this moment. Thank you. I think it's something we're all thinking about, right? Like, how do we imagine this thing that's never existed before? And uh, I think if there's anybody who can lead us there, it's a group of really, you know, artists who are already in the mode of working in the unknown kind of you all know that territory better than a lot of people so i'm excited to see what comes next so um unfortunately i know we had like one or two other questions in there but i want to make sure we kind of keep on time and i think that thinking about the future as a close out for our q a is a good place for us to end um so Moving on, I'm really excited to share with you all the announcement of um, our next cohort of distillery artists who is going to be um, moving in with us uh, this weekend. So this is gonna be our 11th cohort of distillery and it includes seven artists. They are Peter Barber, Paper Buck, Eriko Hattori, Caleb Hickerson, Deborah Hosking, Glendon Hyde, and Lou Tandon. And um, 
I'm really looking forward to seeing how their work changes over the next year from these images you've just seen kind of flash before you. Their exhibit will be up with us um, next spring, you know, if things go as they're supposed to. <laughs> and um, that's really what we had planned for tonight. So thank you, thank you all for joining us and running through our first uh, go at this with Zoom. And um, just a reminder, the exhibit is open through September 12th. If you wanna come and investigate some of these pieces in more detail, get a chance to really see what these artists were talking about up close, please come visit us. Our gallery hours are listed on the slide here. If you prefer to come privately, um, to the gallery, please email us um, at info at brewhousearts.org to set up a private appointment. If you can try to email us at least 48 hours in advance, that's really helpful in us trying to accommodate you. And um, we hope to see you soon. If you enjoyed the talk tonight and think the programs we're doing are cool, we would love for you to support us. You can um, follow the link that I believe is getting dropped in the chat right now to do that. Um, and like I said before, if you wanna support these artists directly, let us know if you'd like to buy some of their work. Visit Small Mall online to see what's available there. And thanks so much.